Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you all here, and especially uh, a pleasure to have uh, Professor Gish with us today. Uh, I want to thank, start by thanking the, uh, the SCC Library for helping, uh, for sponsoring this event and, and bringing it to us. It's a, it's a real help. Uh, this, of course, is the academic lecture of Willan and Westlaco. So we're, we're quite pleased by, uh, by this aspect. We're really pleased that South Texas College can join this uh, community festival. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Smith. Uh, I'm the uh, coordinator for Willan and Westlaco. Uh, I'm a teacher here at South Texas College in the political science department. Um, uh, more to the point, I'm just one person. I'm uh, one of, of many really good people here in Westlaco. There is a large army of volunteers uh, and along this, the very generous patrons, uh, all of whom cooperate to make this community festival happen. Uh, of course, all the money that's raised uh, for uh, in this festival goes to uh, two of our public institutions, the uh, Westlaco um, uh, Museum and the Westlaco Towers Theatre. Uh, so uh, what is Willen in Westlaco? Willen in Westlaco is uh, every spring we publicly celebrate uh, one play by the Immortal Bard. Uh, 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 Willen Westco is the Valley's one and only Shakespeare Festival. So performances of this play, of course, gather a wide audience, but Shakespeare's work is so good and beautiful that many other, other of our uh, best artists and academics uh, outside the theater gravitate towards contributing their thoughts and talents. Uh, Shakespeare is so good, in other words, uh, he's not limited to the art and thought of the festival, uh, of, the, of the theater, excuse me. Um, uh, this points to uh, the why or the purpose of, uh, of our festival, uh, and that is uh, Shakespeare is not only popular, he's good. Uh, uh, he's very good intellectually and more. And so uh, what better way to bring the community, the whole community together? Uh, so just a, a quick uh, summary of, of the festival. Uh, we start with an, uh, uh, an art exhibition um, at the uh, Westlaco Museum. Uh, last Saturday was a screaming success. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that we have the executive director with us here today, uh, Crystal Rodriguez. Uh, it was, uh, we had overflow. How many, we, we couldn't keep, we had so many people, uh, we were worried about uh, uh, having enough room uh, for everyone. It was fantastic. Uh, today we have the academic lecture. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, uh, tomorrow we have three films at the public library. Uh, so uh, at 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, at the West Coast <coughs> Library, we're playing the Fassbender edition and the um, and the uh, Denzel Washington version uh, at the public library tomorrow. At 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Also, uh, the following Wednesday on the 26th. Uh, on the 20th, 21st, 22nd, 27th, and uh, 28th and 29th, uh, the play is being performed at the Tower Theater, the West Coast Tower Theater. Uh, tickets can be purchased online or at the door. I uh, hope you'll uh, uh, attend, the, attend. The prices are great. Uh, the actors are, are fantastic. Our director, is is unbelievable. Uh, uh, Roli Martinez, uh, classically trained, uh, actually has uh, performed um, uh, in um, in England uh, at the Globe Theatre. So he's he's excellent. Uh, I couldn't uh, wish for a better director. Uh, but today today we're doing the um, uh, welcome. Come on in. Come on in. Hi. Uh, uh, today we'll, we'll start with the academic lecture. Uh, let me introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Gish. Uh, Dr. Gish is uh, an associate professor in the Honors College at the University of Houston, where he teaches uh, courses in the history uh, of political thought, as well as the college's signature great books year-long seminar course, The Human Situation, Antiquity, and Modernity. Uh, Dr. Gish received his PhD from the Interdisciplinary Institute of Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas with a concentration in politics. He earned his MA in politics at the University of Dallas and his MA in liberal education at St. John's College in Santa Fe. Uh, his undergraduate degrees in, uh, his under, 
graduate degree uh, in political science, philosophy, and history are from the University of Oklahoma. He is the author of Xenophon's Socratic Rhetoric, Philosophy, Eros, and Virtue in the Symposium, uh, the only monograph length commentary on Xenophon's dialogue. His other publications uh, subsist of eight edited volumes, including uh, Shakespeare and the Body Politic. Uh, some of you will know that from last year's speaker, uh, Pam Jensen. Uh, she published a, a, her, uh, uh, her, her talk. It was very much following the argument from that book. Uh, Souls with Longing, right? Uh, representations of, of honor and love in Shakespeare. And uh, Shakespeare's political thought. Dr. Gish also lived in Italy, teaching at the University of Dallas, uh, uh, the Rome campus there. Uh, and uh, John Cabot University and the American University of Rome. Uh, without, uh, without much more ado, uh, welcome Dr. Gish. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well, uh, let me say first, thank you to Professor Smith for the invitation to join all of you as part of this fantastic festival in honor of Shakespeare's birthday. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you all today about this Scottish play and tragedy, Macbeth. My remarks are not intended to capture the meaning of the play as a whole, uh, but to raise a series of questions based on a close reading of the play, which will hopefully call your attention to what I think is a surprising theme in the play. And that theme is anticipated in the title of my talk, namely that the Macbeths, and that is Macbeth and Lady Macbeth as partners, are in speech and indeed engaged in a rather dangerous enterprise, conquering fortune. They succeed, as you know, in at least a portion of their plan to conquer fortune. They do become king and queen of Scotland. Now, this great fortune is not one into which they are born, nor is it one where the greatness has been thrust upon them by fate or chance, but rather they achieve this greatness on their own, seizing the opportunity to take this greatness for themselves by conquering fortune. And because the Macbeth succeed rather than fail, at least in this part of the enterprise, we have to wonder wherein lies the tragedy. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit in the argument, so let me just say right now before I begin, but I'll take about 45 minutes or so to talk about the play, but I'm especially looking forward to the time that remains at the end to hear your questions and thoughts and for us to have a good discussion of the play. So to begin, let me start by referring you to the opening, one of the opening scenes of the play. After hearing from the witches about the fortune of Macbeth in act one, scene three, Banquo prompts the weird sisters for a prophecy of his own. He says, my noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope. But he addresses the witches and says, if you can look into the seeds of time and say which grains will grow and which will not, speak then to me. And what Banquo articulates here is implicit in the way that the witches have hailed Macbeth, that the titles by which they hail Macbeth speak of a future as if it were here now, a present grace, in great prediction all at once. Thane of Gloms, Thane of Cawdor, both of which titles are in the moment of their address presently true. Although Macbeth has not yet been made aware of the fact that he has been made Cawdor by Duncan. These are the present graces bestowed upon Macbeth referred to by the witches. Or rather, to be more precise, maybe we could say this, that when the witches hail Macbeth as Gloms, they are looking to the past, for he has ceased to be Gloms and become Cawdor in the present. Only the title of king shall be hereafter, which is to say in the future. So they speak to him past, present, and future, Gloms, Cawdor, king. And it is this same future that Banquo wants to hear spoken of with respect to himself. So this quote unquote prophetic greeting as Macbeth calls it, heralds the future, which holds out a great prediction about his fortune. Indeed, the greatest fortune of all, that he shall be king. 
Now, Macbeth concludes from being hailed by Ross and Angus as Thane of Cawdor, that the witches have spoken the truth, but that what lies hereafter is still a matter of fortune or of chance that he doesn't fully understand. Macbeth, speaking to himself in an aside, says, nothing is but what is not. And Banquo, observing Macbeth's amazement, says, look how our partners rapt, amazed. But Macbeth, meanwhile, continuing to be caught up in his own thoughts, reflects upon what has happened, what is happening, and what may yet happen. As he says to himself, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. Come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. So the, the, the scene thus ends with Macbeth thinking upon what hath chanced. That is what chance hath thus far wrought for him and hence of what his future fortune might yet be. And Macbeth is considering his fortune as a matter of chance. And in the next scene, when he speaks with Duncan who proclaims him worthy Cawdor, Macbeth still sees what future may come as being determined by chance. Indeed, the elevation of Duncan's son Malcolm to the title of Prince of Cumberland as the heir apparent to the throne confounds Macbeth, for that seems to stand in the way of the fulfillment of the witch's prophecy in the future. How can Macbeth become king hereafter if that royal hope and crown will belong to Malcolm? So this is the state of mind in which Macbeth hastily writes to Lady Macbeth, informing her of what has happened and of what might happen. He writes to her of their impending arrival at the castle, but he also speaks of the witches. In his letter, we learn that he unfolds his thoughts to her because his fortune, if it is to come true, will also be hers. And even more importantly, we learn that what the future promises for them, they will receive as partners. Quote, this is Lady Macbeth reading from the letter. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it all, these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail, king that shall be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. The greatness that is promised Lady Macbeth, as well as Macbeth, it seems, is one that still lies in the future. If he is to be hailed hereafter as king, though, she will be hailed as queen. So they are dear partners in this greatness. The enterprise that the Macbeths embark upon is more than the acquisition of the throne from good King Duncan. For the witches have planted the seeds of that acquisition in time. Come what come may, as Macbeth himself says, he will be Cawdor and is now Cawdor, but he will be king hereafter. Fortune, it would seem, is on their side. For what the future holds in store for worthy Macbeth and his wife, according to the witch's prophecy, is not just his becoming Thane of Cawdor, which he has become, but King of Scotland. These are the seeds in time that will grow. This is what lies in wait for Macbeth and for Lady Macbeth. But they are not contented with that. Their enterprise is the conquest of fortune itself. Through their conquering fortune, the Macbeths reject any reliance upon fortune, which waiting for the kingship would seem to entail. Instead, they decide that fortune favors the bold. They seize the day, taking in hand the daggers before them, and so bring into being for themselves and by themselves the very future that is being promised to them. They do not wait for fortune to bestow its gifts of greatness upon them. They take what they desire by their deeds. Now, the Scottish play, as many of you know, is the shortest of Shakespeare's tragedies, even as the Macbeths would have it, it seems. If it were done, then twere well, it were done quickly. To put this another way, this play's action hastens. It hurries us along, moving with a sudden and inescapable swiftness. But the direction in which we and the Macbeths are headed is not a matter of fortune. The course of action is determined. 
But even so, it is not inevitable. It is rather willful. Things might have turned out the same way in the fullness of time, but the Macbeths will not wait to see what happens. They, by their very own act and valor, do take what they desire and has been foretold. And we, like the action of the play, are driven forward by the willfulness of the Macbeths, by their doing of the deeds that would make it so. Thus are we thrust from one scene to the next, it seems with no time to spare, no pause to catch our breath. The play in this way, the play is this way because the Macbeths would have it so. Conquering fortune rather than waiting for her to bestow her gifts in good time is the Macbeths enterprise. Now, why, why do I call their conquest of fortune an enterprise? First of all, because it seems to me that what the Macbeths are doing is Machiavellian. And by Machiavellian, I mean that they are enacting the lessons Machiavelli taught in his work titled The Prince. The enterprise of the prince is to acquire and to maintain state. And this is what Machiavelli promises to teach those who read his work. Now, I don't wanna to spend too much time focusing on Machiavelli's text since our focus today is on Shakespeare's play. But let me say that in this regard, it's also an enterprise for the reason that Lady Macbeth herself, when speaking in private, calls it that. This is the calling of the deed uh, in the midst of the scene where she is having to reassure Macbeth about their purpose. If you recall that after deciding upon their course of action and with the arrival of King Duncan at Inverness, Macbeth and Lady Beth, Lady Macbeth, speak privately in act one, scene three the last scene in what is the most frenetic first act in all of Shakespeare's plays. And in scathing words, Lady Macbeth rebukes her husband for wavering. What they have decided to do must now be done. But Macbeth, whose nature she knows is full of human kindness, has been having second thoughts. This is Macbeth. We will proceed no further in this business. Duncan hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in all their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Lady Macbeth, however, says, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did decide so freely? From this time such I account thy love, Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Prithee peace, says Macbeth. I, do, I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. To which she replies quickly, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Their enterprise then, as she calls it, which they would dare to do, is to conquer fortune and seize the crown. And the time for doing it, Lady Macbeth insists, is now. The opportunity has presented itself to the Macbeths to make true the fortune that the prophecy of the witches has foretold. The future then is now. It is Lady Macbeth who has decided that it must be so. When Macbeth returns home to his castle, Lady Macbeth greets him with her plan for how to accomplish this. This is act one, scene five. She says, as soon as she sees him, great gloms, worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present. And I feel now the future in the very instant. Now, while he had only spoken in his letter of the promise that the future holds for both of them, Lady Macbeth has already determined that her husband would be great and that therefore he shall do what must be done to take for himself that which has been promised in the prophecy, though he himself might balk at the doing of it. Thus to herself, she proclaims just before his arrival, also in Act 1, Scene 5, Hie thee hither, my dearest love, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear 
and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. Now, after her greeting of him, she immediately moves him towards her plan, which in its fullness she has not yet revealed. She says, he that's coming must be provided for. That's Duncan, of course. And you, Macbeth, shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. Macbeth, she says, must therefore fit his face to the time and, quote, leave all the rest to me. Her plan, then, is the means by which their enterprise will achieve its aim, to conquer fortune, bring the future into the present, and seize the kingship, not waiting for the seeds to grow in time, but having it now. Despite his doubts about the justice of the deed, Lady Macbeth's words screw Macbeth's courage to the sticking place, and he says the plan is settled. So at this point, having spoken of the Macbeth's enterprise and of Lady Macbeth's plan to acquire for themselves what that which future fortune promises, let me turn your attention to the action of the play as it unfolds from the very beginning. So let me turn now to a little bit of a summary uh, of Acts one through three, but with a special focus on the on the on the opening of the play, how out of disorder comes a new order, or another way of saying this in a Machiavellian way, how to acquire the state. Now, at least one thing is painfully evident from the start of the play: if Scotland in the time of Macbeth is indeed intended by Shakespeare to be thought of as a monarchy or a kingship of some sort, it also should be obvious that it is a failing political order. Recall what we see immediately in the first, in the second of scene of the first act, uh, domestic insurrection. There's factionalism among the Thanes, and divided loyalties. These divided loyalties have led to quiet rebellion and then outright rebellion and civil war. The merciless McDonald wall, the Thane of Cawdor is an armed open resistance to Duncan. But there's also a foreign invasion. And we find out about this uh, hard on the heels of the news about the rebellion, that there is also an invasion of the Norwegian army uh, by King Suino. And a covert invasion leads to an undeclared war, a foreign war. But in addition to this, one suspects that these two events are not unconnected. There's some suggestion that there's a conspiracy or some collusion between MacDonwald and Sweno, the king of Norway, that there is an attempted coup underway internally, but with foreign aid. And I would suggest not only Cawdor, but per perhaps Macduff, the Thane of Fife, is involved. You recall that Norway invades without much resistance through the lands of Fife. Now, the action of the play, in other words, commences with Scotland in a state of revolt, of factionalism turned to violent rebellion and civil war at home, as well as foreign invasion and treason as well, possibly, with respect to foreign affairs. Scotland is, in other words, in near chaos and approaching political collapse. The king himself, good old Duncan, needs the messenger to report whether, to put it bluntly, he is really still the king of Scotland at all, or if he has lost it to the rebels and the foreign king's army invading. If he is indeed still king, the reason for it is not his own, but the arms of Macbeth and Banquo. Shakespeare thus immediately raises for us at the very opening of the play, the dilemma of political stability as a dire problem. Something is rotten in the state of Scotland. Now, at the beginning of the play, not counting the supernatural scene with witches, it's clear Scotland is in turmoil, that it is teetering on a pre precipitous brink, either of being broken apart or of falling apart. Man, we hear, is a bloody thing, according to the opening line of the first human scene, prone to disunion and dissolution. What is the most recent state of revolt, Duncan asks in Act 1, Scene 2. Line one. 
Human beings, it seems, and their loyalties are always in flux. Forces of instability may always be contending against efforts to establish and maintain order. Perhaps then turmoil and constant change, even periodic violent upheaval, are more characteristic of human affairs than order and stability. What if political communities are inevitably subject not only to the laws of entropy and gradual decay, just like the rest of the material universe? What if political communities of every kind, republics, kingdoms, dukedoms, principates, are always subject to destructive forces of factional strife and domestic insurrection, forces naturally and inevitably resistant to our efforts to establish a centripetal force sufficient to bind or hold together many as one, e pluribus unum. Now, to borrow a few lines from Yeats as commentary on the political situation in Duncan, Scotland, recall these words, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood-dimmed tide of innocence is drowned, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. So is Scotland really a monarchy? We tend to assume that it is, but how do we really know that it is? What evidence do we have in the play? If Scotland is a unified kingdom, what centripetal force holds it together? Without that force, alive, vital, and strong at the center, will the Thanes always be inclined to assert their independence and even to rebel? revealing that the semblance of unity can be quickly dissolved and fall apart into its constituent elements. Perhaps Scotland is a kingdom that has either by tradition or necessity cultivated, even preserved such internal tensions. So to repeat then, if Scotland is a kingship at all, it's an unusual one. It's hard to figure out exactly what kind of kingship it is. Now Machiavelli's Prince chapter four offers what I think is a useful approach to understanding what kind of principality or state Scotland is. Let me just read to you a short passage from chapter four of the Prince. Machiavelli says this, the principates of which we have memory are governed in two modes, either by a prince and all others are his servants who being ministers by his grace and permission help him to govern the kingdom or in a second mode by a prince and barons or nobles who have their rank not by the grace of the prince but by the antiquity of their blood. Whoever considers then that these two states, whoever considers then these two states will discover that the former, which is a prince who rules and has only servants beneath him, is difficult to acquire, but once conquered, easy to maintain. Whereas the latter state, the state that is ruled by a prince together with his barons. This kind of state is in some respects easier to take, but only with great difficulty does one hold on to it. I think this helps to understand the situation in Scotland. Now, to say something about uh, King Duncan and his virtues. I wonder what prospects, if any, King Duncan has to assure himself of the loyalty, loyalty of the Scots nobles who are rather unruly, ambitious, and obviously discontented. He does have the loyalty of Macbeth and Banquo, who are the best or greatest of the Thames, or at least he has their unambitious loyalty at the start of the play. Only the arms of Macbeth secure Duncan against both domestic rebellion and foreign invasion. Without Macbeth, Duncan would surely have lost the kingdom. Now, Duncan himself knows this and rewards the merit of his loyal thanes, Macbeth and Banquo, with unexpected and unlooked for honors. Duncan distributes honor justly, in other words, a fact which Macbeth himself begrudgingly admits later in Act One, Scene Seven. His new title, Cawdor, is itself his reward for loyalty. Having been stripped off the disloyal traitor Macdonwald, whose treachery is openly revealed, and whose execution is ordered by the king, 
It is the loyal and worthy Macbeth who receives the disloyal Thane's former title. King Duncan proclaims, what Cawdor hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. But remember, even Macbeth had thought Cawdor originally a prosperous gentleman of good repute, as he says in Act 1, Scene 3. And Duncan, by his own admission, had held Cawdor to be a gentleman in whom I built an absolute trust, he says in Act 1, Scene 4. To strip him of his title and estate and to execute him before even receiving Cawdor's own confession would seem to imply not only that Duncan can be deceived, but that the titles of the thanes, in Duncan's view, are bestowed and revoked by his will. At least that that's what Duncan seems to believe because he acts in this way. The thanes present do not openly disagree with Duncan's actions. Now be this as it may, it is only Macbeth's loyalty and courage in battle, which ultimately preserves for Duncan his kingdom and his asserted right to dispose of the estates of his loyal thanes as he sees fit. But the very fact of the rebellion, to say nothing of the invasion, would seem to imply otherwise, that all is not well in Duncan, Scotland, and that he does not have a handle on events. Save for Macbeth, things would have fallen apart, for the center was not able to hold. So further questions arise. Is Macbeth the bond that guarantees the unification of Scotland as a kingdom? Or is it Duncan? Which is, it, which is to say, is it a strong man or is it the traditional authority of a so-called king? Who is really the force at the center holding Scotland together? If the strength of a kingdom is the power of a king, well, who really rules as king over Scotland? Macbeth or Duncan? We might wonder also, why is Macbeth loyal? Is it because Duncan is a good king who rewards those who serve him loyally, buying their love? After rewarding Macbeth, Duncan does go on to praise and reward Banquo too, although perhaps not to the degree that Banquo might have hoped. But further, there are reasons also here that are unclear why Duncan chooses this very moment to reward his son, Malcolm, by investing him with the title of the Prince of Cumberland and bestowing his estates on this heir apparent. When he does so, he says, honor is being distributed to a host of stars who shine in nobleness, that is the Thanes, especially Macbeth and Banquo, but it is his eldest son who seems to have received the greatest recognition from Duncan. But what exactly has Malcolm accomplished in loyal service to his father to be deserving of such honor? Is this new Prince of Cumberland superior in honor in any way to the new and loyal Thane of Cawdor, that is Macbeth? If he is, in what respect? What exactly is the relationship thus established between the Prince and the various Thanes once Malcolm is elevated? Macbeth wonders this himself. And he seems to think that the new prince will be an obstacle to his own ambition and to the prophecy of the witches. Now, was it just indeed for Duncan to elevate, was it just for Duncan to elevate his son at a time when his own weakness had been exposed? And when that very son in the present rebellion had failed to defend either his father's kingdom or you might recall himself, he was on the verge of being captured, he said, if others had come to his aid. Now, Macbeth and Macduff later both referred to Duncan's virtues and his gentle rule. But what exactly are the virtues of this king? Even if the discontented nobles in Scotland, like Macdonwald, have no real cause to justify their rebellion against Duncan or Norway's invasion, and we can, for the sake of argument, just assume that they are acting unjustly, like Donwald as well as Sweno. But the very fact of rebellion and invasion would seem to be proof enough that a sovereign must be prepared to defend his rule by force when necessary. So again, we must wonder why, for example, did so many fellow rebels swarm to the traitor Cawdor from the Western Isles, as we're told in Act 1, Scene 2? 
Why was Cador, who Macbeth says prospered under Duncan, willing and it seems eager to conspire, not only to rebel against him, but perhaps to work with Norway, whose invasion seems timed to have been in concert with the rebellion? Why didn't Duncan foresee or recognize these villainies before they occurred, these potentially fatal disruptions to his rule? Why was he not better prepared? Why was he so easily deceived by Cador? He placed an absolute trust in him after all. Duncan says that he doesn't know the art of reading faces as a way of knowing what men have in their minds or hearts, but somehow a king, a good king needs to be able to do so to judge the character of those around him. So I would say that Duncan is a good man and that, and that is his vice as king. He trusts the men around him to be good as well. The way, as Macbeth said, he bears his royal faculties so meek and has been clear, open, transparent in his great office and dealings with others. And that has made him vulnerable to those who do not behave in the same way, both within his kingdom and beyond, those who want to move through deception. The king of Norway has been planning his invasion for some time, it seems, colluding with some of the discontented thanes in order to know exactly when to try to seize his own advantage. A turn of events that catches Duncan completely off guard and unprepared without Macbeth. Only the valor and initiative of warlike Macbeth, who moves swiftly after the battle against the rebels to meet the invasion of Norway near Fife, saves Duncan's reign. Without Macbeth, Duncan's rule would have ended, as well as Scotland's independence, it seems, because Norway would have been king. Now, Duncan is too good, or rather too naive and unsuspecting of human ambition to be able to rule as a good king, if by good here we mean successful. Now, again, let me refer you to Machiavelli's Prince. This is chapter 15. Machiavelli says this. Because there is such a distance between how one lives and how one ought to live, that he who lets go that which is done for that which ought to be done learns his ruin rather than his preservation. For the man who wishes to profess the good in everything needs must fall among so many who are not good. Hence it is necessary for a true prince if he wishes to maintain his state to learn to be able to be not good and to use it or not use it according to the necessity. King Duncan being good cannot see how to be not good when it is necessary. Lacking the art of war or capacity to defend his own realm from internal threats as well as external invasion, he has no choice but to rely upon the arms of others to maintain his kingdom. He puts his trust therefore in fortune that others will do good by him. Among his great friends, the nobles, at least some of whom are not loyal, and a few of whom are actively plotting his overthrow, it seems Duncan is content to be loved rather than feared. But his rule thus depends upon fortune and the good faith and loyalty of others, some of whom may actually hold him in contempt. Perceptions of his royal weakness may not only allow but encourage unruly ambition among his well-armed friends. And it certainly does just that among his foes like Norway, as the opening act makes abundantly clear. Duncan's weakness, that is his reliance upon the love and loyalty of others in order to maintain his rule, comes to light as folly. And particularly so in act one, scene six, when he walks blindly and with a smile into the open arms of his own assassins. The tragic irony of his blindness is driven home by the fact that he delivers a homily on hospitable love to Lady Macbeth, whose own smile at that moment con conceals her most bloody intent. He takes her hand and enters the castle at Inverness without even a second thought about her loyalty or about Macbeth's great love, which he takes to be for him. He believes or he wishes to believe that everyone in his presence loves him. 
Thus Duncan lives by the grace of God and the goodness of men and dies when that God and those men betray his trust. Duncan as king therefore trusts himself almost entirely to fortune. His reign might have survived his innocent view of human nature if he had not unwittingly committed an offense against the great Macbeth by bestowing honor on the head of his son, a much less deserving man, placing him in line to the throne. The elevation of Malcolm to a position that blocks the path of the much more deserving Macbeth to the kingship. This is what seems to be precisely the occasion that opens the mind of Macbeth to the rhetoric of his wife's tongue, to act rather than wait, to acquire what has been promised. What has been foretold will be taken by them now. Whatever may be Lady Macbeth's reasons for wanting to assassinate Duncan, and she has several, the warrior Macbeth seems to be moved as much by a sense of righteous indignation as he is by mere ambition. Now let me switch and say something about the manly virtues of the Macbeths and the conquest of fortune. And yes, I'm gonna talk about the manly virtues of both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Now Duncan's virtues as a good man are in several respects his vices as king. Macbeth on the other hand has the virtues of a warrior who is willing to dare and to do what a man must in order to acquire power as king. The deed that he vows to do and is indeed done is in some respects unnatural and even more than bloody, as he says. But still, as Lady Macbeth makes clear, this is what must be done in order to fulfill the prophecy of the weird sisters. Yet these are deeds that must not be thought of once they are done she says, for thinking of them will only make us mad. She says, Lady Macbeth does, that what must be done must be done quickly, as Macbeth himself intuits, lest he lose his courage to act while he is thinking, but also, once done, must be forgotten. Now Macbeth, as Lady Macbeth predicted, became a man, and even much more than a man as king, by daring to do the deed that fulfilled her plan and seemingly their enterprise. But with the murder of Duncan, Macbeth cannot shake from his mind the dishonorableness of this course of action. When he ex exposes his thoughts to Lady Macbeth, she chastises him, infirm of purpose, she says, be not lost so poorly in your thoughts, as she rebukes her husband again for wavering in his manliness. To which Macbeth replies with resignation, to know my deed, twere best not know myself. Arising once more to the occasion, Macbeth does play the part that Lady Macbeth has planned for him. And by the end of act two, Macbeth departs from Inverness Castle and makes his way to Scone, where he will be invested with the sovereignty and that promised title of King of Scotland. Now, what has been done by Macbeth, however, in accomplishing the plan has not been done without the help of his partner, Lady Macbeth, his quote, dearest partner of greatness. Macbeth, therefore, is not alone in his manliness. There is something manly about Lady Macbeth too. Recall that she had prepared herself for doing what must be done by invoking unnatural spirits to strip from her nature all womanly compassion. Act one, scene five, she says, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood and stop up the excess, the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall you murdering ministers, end quote. Now, after the deed is done and the kingdom is acquired, the queen chastises Macbeth once more saying, act, scene, uh, act three, scene two, how now, my Lord, why do you keep alone of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think upon? 
Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. Her manliness, I would suggest, is here beyond question. But what exactly does it mean to be manly in this play? Well, I would suggest this, that the play helps us to understand that manliness is being self-reliant, leaving nothing to chance, disdaining fortune, making one's own way in the world as it is, not merely as we wish it to be, or in other words, being the master, not the subject of fate. Disdaining fortune, which is how Macbeth was first spoken about. The disdaining fortune, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth both seize upon the means to bring the promised future into the present on their own terms and by their own hands. We might even say that Macbeth has become a man by being ruled by manly women, Four of them, in fact, the three bearded witches and Lady Macbeth herself. Here it might be useful to recall again Machiavelli, who infamous, infamously said in The Prince that fortune is a woman, and if one wishes to master her, she must be conquered. He or she who fails to master fortune by means of virtue will in turn be mastered by her. Fortunately for Macbeth, his partner in this enterprise of greatness, is at crucial moments even more manly than he is. Now, I want to say something quickly about Acts 4 and 5, when things fall apart again, which is to say this section is on how not to maintain the state. Acts 1 through 3 showed us how to acquire the state, but then we see the failure to maintain it. So once he has acquired kingship, Macbeth must be and is willing to continue in his bold and daring bloody deeds. Now anticipating Lady Macbeth and foreseeing all that must be done, he believes, to secure his newly acquired kingship. He says in Act 3, Scene 2, a dreadful, a deed of dreadful note remains to be done. And he tells her when she asks what's to be done, be innocent of the knowledge till thou do applaud the deed. He doesn't reveal to her what he intends to do, only that he will do it. But here is where Macbeth begins to go wrong. His manliness turns towards the extreme and becomes unnecessary cruelty, specifically to Macduff's family. Now, the reason for this is uh, strange. He trusts too much in his faith, which has been revealed to him on the second meeting with the witches. But their intention now is to confound him with new prophecies. They say to him, and he begins to, quote, scorn death and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. He trusts too much in the apparent reassurance of the witches, thinking that he should be bloody bold and resolute, and that he should laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Trusting in this fortune revealed to him in a cryptic way by the witches. Macbeth, in fact, unmans himself and becomes womanly through his dependence upon fortune. He loses what he had acquired, which is to say he depends too much on the fortune as he understand it, understands it that has been told to him now by the witches. In the absence of Lady Macbeth, whose diseased mind could not minister unto itself, Macbeth then fails to hold and maintain the very state and rule that by his virtue and hers, they had acquired. Their plan to acquire the kingship succeeded, but to accomplish their enterprise, the conquest of fortune, their acquisition had to be maintained. And in this, the Macbeths failed. Mac Macbeth himself turned away from what must be done to maintain, and instead, recklessly and impetuously, sought to prevent a future that he had no need to control in order to maintain his rule, namely the fate of the kingship after his death and the rule of Banquo's descendants, which was foretold. Lady Macbeth, for her part, apparently allowed the doubts which she chased away from Macbeth to become inextricably lodged in her own thoughts. 
keeping her from any rest or sleep. So let us say then, in conclusion, that the tragedy of the play is, I think, neither the fact that they took power from Duncan, nor the bloody means by which they did so, but rather that having acquired the kingdom in the way that they did, they both were then led into temptation by their own success. But in fact, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth failed to see how much more their enterprise really demanded of them. Thank you. Uh, that was great. Thank you very much, Professor Gish. Okay, uh, uh, first we should always start with the students. Uh, any questions from the students? Always start with the students. Okay. Uh, 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 any of the faculty uh, want to ask questions? Or... Do I have students in here? Uh, do we have any students? I don't, I don't, do we have any questions? We haven't had any uh, questions coming through the chat just yet. I've been keeping an eye on it. So, so. <clears throat> um, uh, is there, um, is there a difference, uh, in regards to time or fortune, in regards to uh, a male or a female, or a woman or a man. I guess I, I was sort of curious to think about that. That in concrete fortune, does it does it does it make a difference? Uh, do, do, do you have to be manly? Uh, in your in your observations. Yeah. So I I um. I, I kind of anticipated this, this would be a question about the manliness in particular. Um, but so I, what I wanted to um, say about it, especially is that when speaking about manliness or womanliness, the way that the play does, we're not talking about men and women, of course, because uh, Lady Macbeth is the principal example of manliness. And Macduff at the, at the, in the first portion of the play is the example of womanliness. Uh, and this is what his own wife accuses him of, of, of running when he should have stayed, of not protecting and fighting for his family, but trusting that things would go well in his absence. He trusted that Macbeth, as bad as he thought he was, wouldn't harm his wife and his children. They're innocent and, and vulnerable. Uh, that Macbeth would come after him. And by leaving, he thought that he left them uh, in safety. So he trusted to fortune too much. He trusted to the goodness of others too much, as Duncan had done at the beginning of the play. So Macbeth, Macduff, at, uh, up until he discovers what Macbeth has done to his family, is the example of womanliness. So you, uh, it's uh, womanliness and manliness here are, are aspects of any human soul. They're not uh, necessarily tied to being a man or a woman. Um, Macbeth, in an interesting way, becomes, as I suggest at the end, becomes womanly because he begins to trust too much in his fortune, which is to say the prophecy that no harm can come to him from man of woman born, which he interprets to mean no, no man can harm me. And then he begins behaving uh, unnecessarily recklessly on the basis of that misunderstanding or trust in the fortune that he thinks the witches have revealed to him. So there's this aspect of womanliness or manliness uh, is, is the way that any human being sort of responds to the future, which is, do you try to uh, take it and make it what you want it to be? Or do you trust that God or providence or the, go the goodwill of others will protect you? So another, another, uh, yeah. So I hope that, hopefully that, that no, no, I just hopefully it, it clarifies a little bit because I, I don't want to say that uh, women are womanly and men are manly, but that womanliness and manliness are aspects of any human soul. Is there any one particular character that conquers fortune, who shows the proper attitude towards fortune? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, uh, Banquo is a possibility, but he 
because of his murder, we don't get to see how things play out for him or how things might have played out for him. Um, he has the first knowledge that Macbeth has about the future. Um, and he, he surely is trying to save his son, Cleance, uh, but I don't think he's trying to save him because he's saving him for a future kingship. I think he cares for his son and is doing what he can to protect him. Um, he just, he fails to, to uh, protect himself even though Flance escapes. Um, the, other op the other possibility is Macduff, but Macduff is, is accused of womanliness by his own wife. In fact, telling their son that he has no father. <laughs> He's missing a man uh, in his life. And, and that's true because Macduff has gone to try uh, what he thinks is to work with uh, Seward and the English and Malcolm to to remove Mac Macbeth from the throne. But by fleeing his home, he's trusting that Macbeth will behave according to certain codes of honor, that you don't attack the vulnerable, uh, especially uh, among your own. But Macbeth has thrown that caution to the wind, or he, he doesn't care about that anymore. He's, he's willing to do any bloody deed that he thinks is necessary. Although, as it turns out, it's, it's not necessary for him to um, maintain his kingship He's in this strange position of trying to stop Banquo's future, as if that is important to his maintenance of his own uh, power, which it's it's not. It's a future he doesn't need to control. Um, I would call, yeah, uh, please, uh, Professor Mas uh, Dr. Masson. If, if Lady Macbeth is manly, then what do you think happens to her when she goes crazy? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's... Um, Sorry, did I? I don't know if I cut you off at the end of your. What what happens to her in particular? Yeah. She becomes woman. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I think she be. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, the temptation that she is led into is, at least presented as in her sleepwalking, these thoughts not really being able to be pushed aside, as she told Macbeth he had to do. He had to. Uh, once the deed is done, forget them, not not linger on them, not keep them alive in his own mind. And it seems from her the, 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 her words while sleepwalking that she can't she can't forget the blood stains on her hand. Um, and so it's it's I'm not I'm trying to think of womanliness and manliness as the way a human being uh, responds to future good or future ill that um, it's, it's how one takes up one's, uh, how one faces the future. Um, and sh she's dying and looking back. So I'm not exactly, I don't think that that's necessarily uh, womanly, but there's something about the, the manliness that she once had, the looking forward and not looking back, looking to a future, trying to conquer that future where sh she's just haunted by the past now. So I'm, you know, there are very, all sorts of ways to read that. It's some notion of, of, uh, of guilt that has that has crept into her soul that she couldn't keep away and it's, it's um, destroyed her. Um, I'm not sure. The case of Macbeth, uh, I think, is the case I make for Macbeth and what happens to him is stronger because we see him more. Uh, we just we we sort of lose sight of her and only get this vestigial remnant of her in her sleepwalking and and then a report that she's gone so it's it's hard to it's hard to really say what has gone on in her mind because she doesn't speak to us after uh act three thank you uh so uh one of the questions from our um live studio audience uh, no from our uh, uh our online yeah our online yeah uh thanks for the interesting talk what about the thing of ross he seems to always come out on top uh, through all the changes of fortune. Is he the fox to Macbeth's lion? That's a good, very good question. Um, I, with Ross and um, with Lennox, uh, they both make it through, and it's you know they seem to be in, able to move from one side to the other. You're never quite sure uh, um, where their loyalties really lie, um, but they but they make it through. So in some sense. The, the metaphor is a good one. They're, they're, they're foxes. They're able to sniff out traps. They're able to avoid Macbeth. They're able to uh, preserve themselves. Um, but I don't think we see enough of them to, 
to be able to judge their character in the uh, in 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 its fullness. So it's it's I think it's a good suggestion, but I don't I don't think Shakespeare gives us enough evidence that he wants us to think of either of them as a model in some respect. Um, they they may as a fox sometimes is just get lucky, and uh, as as others don't, like uh, Seward's son, for example, um, or Macduff's son. Yeah. Uh, another question from online. Uh, do you see the end of the play as just going back to the conditions before the disturbances of the Macbeths, which Malcolm, uh, with Malcolm just another soft Duncan, who is not uh, uh, not a center that will hold? Let me read that again. Do you see the end of the play as just going back to the conditions before the, dis the disturbances of the Macbeths, with Malcolm just another soft Duncan? who is not yeah. a center that will hold. Yeah, but there's, uh, in some ways, Malcolm is, is even worse than his father because Malcolm's uh, return to the throne, if that's what it is, um, is dependent on English arms this time. Uh, Duncan's rule was dependent on Macbeth's arms. So at least he had a thane of his own to rely on uh, as long as that thane was loyal. Um, but Malcolm now has to rely on the English. So he's he's bought the throne, but at the price of actual independence, it seems to me. Um, Ma Machiavelli would say he's no prince at all because the one who wins the principality is the one who has the arms, and that's England in this scenario. Um, so I actually think it's yeah, Scotland is still in the same state of disorder that it was in before, but uh, potentially worse because what Norway attempted by force. Uh, England seems to have accomplished by apparent uh, uh, compassion. Edward the Confessor has helped out, but in fact, he's brought uh, Malcolm under his uh, under his wing, or maybe better, under his thumb. Uh, my question is about King Duncan. You say that he is too good a man to be king, and that his goodness as a man are his vices as king. Would you say there's a way to balance that out, to be a good man and a good king, but also be wise enough to see the vices and to not fall into those traps as King Duncan did? Uh, it's a very fine line uh, because in order to be able to have the art of reading faces, which is what Duncan says he lacks, and is the reason why he didn't know Cawdor was not a man on whom you should build your absolute trust. Uh, in, in order to be able to think those kinds of thoughts, there needs to be something in the person who's that's able to conceive of those who are not good as not good, uh, not as fallen or mistaken, or um, you, you, you wish for the best with them and then they, you know, something turned out poorly, but that there's actual evil intent um, Cador has been planning this for some time uh, while Duncan has been blissfully ignorant of it. Um, and he's close to him. So um, it's it's hard for me to imagine, maybe it's too much reading of Machiavelli, but uh, it's hard for me to imagine that you can be a truly good man and succeed as king unless the circumstances allow for it, which is to say being a, a good person and a good king will work in a context in which you have other factors controlling the evil that might arise. So the, the, the problem is that even if you are uh, a good person ruling in a good kingdom and have around you those who are truly loyal and not conspiring against you, um, if, if times change, say Norway invades, you still need to be able to defend it. It's at that moment when you're going to rely most upon the Thanes, but you need to be assured of either their loyalty or how to, as Machiavelli says, how to hold them firm when the moment comes that you need them most, because they'll recognize that you need them, and that would be the moment for them to uh, conspire against you. So it, it's it's hard to imagine what it would look like for a truly good person to be able to comprehend that which is not good 
in others and to be able to anticipate it and respond to it accordingly. Well, uh, can I follow that up? Uh, um, what, what is admirable? I, I know, could you clarify or, or maybe say a little bit more about what is admirable in Macbeth and Lady Macbeth uh, so that they're, they're tragic? Uh, just could you, like, at the start, we like them. We, we hope that, well, okay, there's a mixed, though, there's a mixed view of, of Lady Macbeth and, and Macbeth. Uh, we both like and dislike them. Uh, we're unsure how to feel about them. Uh, I'm echoing uh, Professor Cantor's uh, piece. Uh, yeah. But uh, what do you think is likable about uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth? Yeah, um, so uh, let me take a 10 second pause. I need to plug in my laptop before. It dies on me, so hang on just one second. <laughs> I thought I had all the technology taken care of before we started, but uh, I, I forgot the power. Um, so I think maybe the word um, admire about the Macbeths is a complicated one because um, one thinks of virtue and nobility as being that, that which we ought to admire. Um, admiring them for their success, however, uh, you know, that seems to be, there's something Machiavellian about that. So um, I guess the, I, I find in Macbeth at the beginning that his, his somewhat, it's not naive, but his loyalty to Duncan is really only um, uh, called into question by himself when the witches tempt him with this knowledge of the future. So I, you know, that we have every reason to believe that he is truly a loyal thane. He had uh, he wanted to have nothing to do with McDonwald. He was he was able to meet the rebel thanes and defeat them. And then he makes the decision apparently on his own to go uh, a distance to meet the invasion at uh, of Norway around Fife. Um, and and all of that, he seems not to have expected anything other than I don't know, just the, the usual thanks for being a good thing. Um, it's, it's somehow the, the witch's foretelling of the future that causes him to begin to have these thoughts that he shouldn't have. Um, so I think that there is something uh, noble and honorable about Macbeth. I don't think he's a, a vicious tyrant through and through as, as you know, he might be thought of by others in the play, right? I mean, this obviously is a play that where uh, tyranny appears, ty tyrant and tyranny appear more frequently here than in any other play. So it's definitely um, associated with Macbeth, but it's always in the mouth of those who despise and hate him. So it's a little hard to, you know, say that everything about him is, is vicious and tyrannical. Um, it's certainly how he's viewed by some, but I think there's something admirable in him even before he acquires the kingdom from Duncan. Um, in in Lady Macbeth, her her firmness of purpose is pretty extraordinary. She she seems to uh, understand from the the rough sketch that Macbeth has given of his uh, of his dialogue with the witches or what he's learned from the witches in this very quick letter. She seems to have wrapped her mind quickly around um, what what it means. And and how to and she begins formulating a plan immediately for how to acquire it now, and not wait for the seeds to grow in time. So there, there's something about that which is admirable. Uh, the 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 um, the outcome that she is after. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, the witches in some way have said that it's warranted that Macbeth shall be king hereafter, and that means she will be queen. But the choice of means, of course, are are would have to be considered vicious. Uh, Duncan is seeking hospitality under their uh, roof as a guest, but she, but she never questions at all their purpose. Uh, and so I, I don't know if you can say that that's admirable uh, in and of itself, but there's something admirable about her, her strength of, of mind and sticking to that purpose. And all the more reason to wonder, as, 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 as someone asked before, all the more reason to wonder what happened to her. Um, she just seems too strong a character to have suddenly been overwhelmed by guilt. Um, and I don't, I don't have a, I don't really have a, a, a persuasive answer to the, 
the question, like what, what exactly happened to her? How, did she, what, what caused her, her decline and fall? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Okay. That was a, um, that was a long winded answer to your question, but it made, it made me think of bringing it back around to the earlier question about Lady Macbeth. Sure. Uh, well, uh, maybe this will, uh, it's another question from online. Um, the center of the, the center, there's a, the, the question of the center is, does Macbeth's or do the Macbeth's, plural, uh, paranoia speak to some kind of denial of death or some kind of fantasy of having total control over fortune during their own lifetime? Uh, let me give you the context. Duncan's mistake was to name his son as heir apparent. Macbeth has no son to leave his kingship to, but mm -hmm. does become paranoid and targets Banquo and Fleance. Having children is one way of admitting to one's own mortality, if you will. Does Macbeth or do the Macbeth uh, paranoia uh, speak to some kind of denial of death or some kind of fantasy of having total control over fortune during their own lifetimes. There's a lot of language in the play about destroying nature, understood as creation, Genesis, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, there's a lot of different ideas in that one question, but um, you could maybe separate out the issue of um, ghosts, uh, Banquo's ghost in particular, from the, the, question, the question's interest in sons and say, um, un unlike Hamlet, um, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth aren't that concerned with the question of the afterlife and whether or not they're gonna be punished for their sins as a result of this. I mean, Macbeth dabbles with it a little bit in his thoughts, but he's, he's really more uh, disturbed by the thought that this act itself is, is dishonorable. Um, and that it does violation to his uh, otherwise loyal uh, attachment to the king. Um, it, it, it's not so much, I don't see them so much thinking about this as uh, punishment in hell after death. So, so that future, what happens to human beings or the human soul after death, um, it, it doesn't really have the same, doesn't cast the same pall over them that it does over Hamlet, who seems to have to figure this out whether or not his father's ghost is, is real or is uh, uh, at all, or is real but a tempting devil, or uh, real and the tortured soul of his, his father. This, this all seems to matter to him quite a lot, especially when it comes to what he's gonna do with Claudius. Um, here, it's not that uh, Lady Macbeth seems to be bothered by the death of Duncan, that there's, she never imagined there was so much blood in the man. Uh, when she's trying to clean her hands while sleepwalking. Um, but Macbeth's uh, seeing of Banquo's ghost uh, seems more like a, um, his violation of the friendship he had with Macbeth. And, you know, for what reason? To prevent Mac, uh, Banquo from becoming king? But Banquo's fortune was not to become king. It's, his sons are to be king. And and as you, it's the the questioner rightly points out, Macbeth doesn't have any sons to worry about. So it's it's strange that Macbeth is unable to live in the present once he acquires the kingship. He seems to want to think about the future and not just his future, but a distant future and someone else's sons becoming king. And uh, th this I think is the overreach on the part of Macbeth that he's able, he's been able to acquire the state and conquer fortune or conquer the future with respect to his own fate. But he also now seems to want to control the fate of others and prevent Banquo's descendants from having what has been foretold to them. He wants to, he wants to cut that string off before uh, those fates are able to come uh, into being, as opposed to winning or conquering one's own fate. So again, I, I'm, it's, I'm not sure what uh, exactly how to answer the, the question, but I think the two different um, uh, problems, the problem of the afterlife, the bank of the ghosts on the one hand, and then the problem of, of children and sons inheriting on the other, I think they have to be somewhat separated. Um, 
I'm tempted whether to ask my own question or, or test the online question. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll say online question. Um, there doesn't seem to be a question here, but Macbeth seems to be, I'm quoting from the, from the online, uh, but, but Macbeth seems to be such an unsympathetic hero. In Act 5, Scene 5, he begrudges the fact that life signifies nothing after having completely decimated the world around him. It's difficult to empathize with him here, and perhaps Shakespeare did not intend to create uh, a sympathetic hero. The play itself seems to present more of a theology, a fall from grace, and philosophy, and, and philosophy about time and destiny than it does a drama about a well-developed character. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think he's intended to be a hero. Um, but this is also something that, as you uh, said earlier, uh, Professor Smith, that Cantor talks about, right? That they're they're neither heroes nor villains; they're they're human beings about, uh, attempting a great enterprise. And there's something about that which one might call heroic. Or it's larger than life, but but they're not heroes with you know. A uh, kind of purity that we would like, or nor are they villains that are just, you know, dark all the way through their soul. There's, there's, they have to be recognizable beings, uh, in order for, in order for us not to have sympathy with them, but for that, for us to see the play as speaking to us as human beings. That if if they are just um, inhuman, uh, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. Then we wouldn't have. It's not that we wouldn't have any sympathy for them. It's that we wouldn't understand our our own soul wouldn't have any touchstone in them, to be able to try to understand something from what they're doing and what they're experiencing. Which which I do think is something that Shakespeare is is doing. He's taking what are real human beings. Yeah, I know that sounds strange because they're fictions, but taking real human. He's presenting us with real human beings in situations that really are almost impossible to imagine happening. But what if a human being could be put into this kind of a circumstance? How would they be tempted? How would they respond? Um, how would they uh, uh, fall? So it's, it's, it's not that, I, I don't think it's about having sympathy for them. I think it's about understanding how the soul responds and being able to say, uh, this, is, this is very unusual. This is unlikely. This is not gonna happen, but it's worth it's worth thinking about because on some smaller scale, the temptation of ambition is something that everyone understands. Um, the willingness to be able to do a little bad in order to accomplish what is understood as a good, this is something everybody understands, but it's just the magnitude and the scale of what's happening in, in Macbeth that it is hard for us to understand. Um, I was curious about what you thought of then of, of Hecate. Uh, who um, who chastises the witches um, for, for uh, going rogue, if you will, uh, um, not uh, not fault, not doing what they ought to do. He comes in, and, or she comes in, excuse me, and uh, uh, chastises the other witches um, uh, and sort of tries to get them in order. And, um, are the so are the witches able to conquer fortune or do they have the same struggles as uh, we mere mortals? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, it, it doesn't seem as if the witches have, they're not the, they're not, they don't have control over the future. Um, they seem to be disruptive forces. Uh, they they want to intervene and they don't commit great. I mean, when they talk about where they've been and what they've been up to, they haven't been up to great evil. They've been up to rather, you know, minor things, irritating people or causing, uh, you know, some, some trauma, but not, you know, not extraordinary trauma. They're not, they don't come across as devilish, I think. Uh, they just come across as um, impish. They just they just want to get involved in things. Um, and it's it, it's a good question to wonder, like, why do they tell Macbeth this fortune? And, we, and the way that Shakespeare opens the play, even if we let's just say set aside the interest of King James and demonology and that, you know, Shakespeare is just appeasing patron by throwing some witches in um, the, the scenes with the witches, they come, they come to the fore immediately without any, they're not imagined by a character. They're not uh, initially witnessed by another character. Um, 
they just they just seem to be in around and creating i don't know disturbances for human beings but they're not actually affecting fortune i mean everything they reveal is to come in the seeds of time but they speak, they do speak cryptically or like uh i don't know like a like the delphic oracle in some way it's it's not evident always to the human beings exactly how this is going to work out although it does work out as they say so with hecate uh, hecate seems to be a, more of a malevolent force i think and uh that's that's because hecate chastises the the witches for getting involved in the first place they they tempted macbeth but but now with the second set of revelations to him the intention is to deceive him is to to drag him along in his confusion towards an ending uh and so they're you know when they say all hail as king macbeth he can't figure out what how is that possible but it is there's a path to it um when when they say you know that he has no worries no man born of woman can harm him it's that's purposely meant to deceive him and make him more bold than he already was and and that becomes his downfall because his unnecessary and and uh extreme cruelty to macduff's family is what brings macduff's vengeance against him so you know imagine that all the all the bloody deeds of macbeth and lady macbeth are accomplished and then uh, as Machiavelli, Machiavelli would say, they stop doing the cruelties that were necessary, and don't. And Macbeth doesn't do um, uh, uh, this violence to Macduff's family. Would Macduff have been so ready and and uh, uh, willing and eager to destroy Macbeth at the head of this English army as he was? Um, even the death of Banquo, even the murder of Banquo. One might imagine it, it It doesn't interrupt fate because the Fleance and the sons, the generations of sons can come into power by some means. Although it's not clear at the end of the play like when, when Fleance or his, uh, his offspring are gonna inherit from Malcolm, um, that's, that's left un, entirely unclear. But um, the, the tempting of Macbeth with that uh, fate, when he first hears it, it's it it sits with Macbeth and and disturbs him enough that he wants to murder uh, Banquo's friend and and his son, but even if he had accomplished that and stopped, that that likely would not have led to his overthrow, because the death of Banquo or even the death of Banquo and Fleance is not enough to inspire the vengeance that Macduff ultimately shows when he finds out what Macbeth has done to his family, so. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's a way in which the uh, the witches push him too far by giving him a what he thinks is a fortune or a fate that he cannot be killed by a man, and then that leads him into this overly bold, overly uh, reckless action against Macduff's family that, that I think is his ultimate downfall or leads to his ultimate downfall. Uh, well, uh, that was yeah. Oh, please. So um, I have a question concerning Machiavelli and the Prince and the relationship, the relationship established to the play. Is there an argument to be made, uh, when, either implicit or explicit, about how to maintain the state or given the brevity of any particular reign of a particular king or indeed the brevity of life itself that it's all kind of feudal in the end? Um, so what do you mean by feudal in the end? Like it, the purpose, the, the attempt to maintain a state, to, to stable, to create a stable society, a stable state, a stable kingdom, or should we, just, or, or there, there, is there Shakespeare just um, uh, contented with understanding that these are all short lived enterprises, as you say? Yeah, no, I, I this is something that uh, I learned from one of my teachers, John Alvis. Uh, that we need to pay close attention always to the political context of every play, even when it seems there isn't one. For example, in The Tempest on an island in the Mediterranean that's un un unknown, unnamed, um, the politics of Italy are still present there in the action of the play. They have an impact on the action of the play. And, the, and 
not just with the histories, but with even the comedies, one one has to consider the political community within within which the action of the play is occurring, and it's never superfluous. Um, Shakespeare is, is even if he's elusive uh, a little bit, he's he's clear about what kind of regime uh, every play is set in, whether it's a republic, a kingship. So 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 I'm saying this as a way of saying that Shakespeare cares about political regimes, about political orders. And um, I don't wanna say that he has in mind a best political order because we don't see that in the play, but we do see as a kind of comparative political philosophy going on when you look at the kingships and the dilemmas that arise within kingships as opposed to say the dilemmas that arise within republics in the place. So I, so I think he does, Shakespeare does think politics matters quite a lot. Um, and, and we see that in the, the settings of the plays and how they affect the action of the plays. So, so I, I wouldn't say that we're supposed to take away from this that politics is, is always failing or a futile attempt to uh, organize and govern human affairs. Um, I, I don't think that's the case. So, so to the question though, is there an argument to be made about the best way to maintain the state, or is this just an example of this is just this is not the way? So, I, um, I think you can see by its at, absence what might have been suggested as the a way to maintain the state. So, at, in in the play, by the time that we get to Act Four, what Macbeth has in mind is securing what he thinks is a future beyond himself, the kingship beyond his own reign. He wants to prevent, for whatever reason, the, 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 uh, uh, the descendants of Banquo from, from coming to power. Uh, none of that has anything to do with his maintenance of his actual rule, because uh, I don't think anyone into, anybody could imagine that the young Fleance, the boy, is somehow gonna overthrow uh, Macbeth and take the kingship from him. Uh, or even that anyone is gonna take up the cause of <laughs> to put him on the throne. I mean, there's many, there's there's the obvious Donald Bain and Malcolm, the sons of Duncan. Uh, there's there's many other contenders that Machiavelli, Machiavelli, that Macbeth should be concerned about. It just doesn't make any sense that he's concerned about Banquo and, and Fleance. So I think that's an indication where Shakespeare is showing you where the excessiveness of his trust and his fortune is, is pushing him towards something that he didn't need to concern himself with in order to maintain his state. Um, so it's only in the negative that we see what might be done to maintain state. Um, Ma Machiavelli has a solution to this, which is, well, one solution. If you're gonna oust a king and, and kill him, be sure that you eliminate his bloodline too, because of course that will always be a threat. So. The real concern for Macbeth was Malcolm, not Fleance. And he somehow got distracted from the issue of Malcolm, who obviously is about to become a threat to him. Uh, and why? And, and instead he's preoccupied with, with uh, Fleance and Banquo's descendants. Um, so I think that's a suggestion of what you don't need to do or shouldn't do when maintaining state. What you should do is pay closer attention to the more obvious uh, challenges or threats. Yeah, no, Macbeth really messes up. If he was going to take the throne, he should have taken, according to Machiavelli, he should have taken out Duncan and his sons all in one. Right? And he yeah, so the only... Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't, mean to, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I would say that the question of how to maintain the state depends on what kind of state it is. So if Macbeth has taken a state which itself is only able to be ruled with the help of things. Because he he doesn't make him, he doesn't crown himself king. He he has murdered Duncan. Uh, some suspect him of it, but most don't. And he's powerful and respected enough that he is invested with the crown at Scone by the consent of the things, or at least the things that are present. Um, so it hasn't become a, a hereditary kingship. Beth has uh, taken control over a, a kind of principality, which is 
in many respects, as Machiavelli says, and as I quoted, it's easy to take because it's disordered. It has elements of discontent within it that can be turned in a conspiracy against the ruler and a new ruler put on the throne. Um, it's very easy to take. It's hard to maintain in that way unless you stop depending on other things. So if uh, if, Ma if Macbeth had recognized the very weaknesses in Duncan Scotland that uh, that were evident at the beginning of the play, then what he should be doing is solidifying the support of the Thanes and concerning himself with Malcolm. What? what it's another thing that is kind of shocking is that the Scottish thanes under Macbeth's tyranny, once he becomes excessive, are praying for English saviors. It doesn't make any sense. Why, why, why would Scottish noblemen, the thanes, be somehow so weak that they have to pray for the English to come save them? So this, this is a sign that the corruption of, of Scotland is, is continuing, right? That it's it wasn't a healthy regime, and Macbeth has done nothing to try to strengthen it. Uh, he's he's uh, you know it's he's not kept his eye on the ball in that regard when it comes to maintenance. Uh, uh, this may seem far fetched, but um, you know there's no story really new under the sun. And we were sitting here discussing it. I I start to feel bad for Macbeth when you were talking about him being um, influenced by these manly manly women. And it reminded me a little bit of the of Samson and Delilah. And, you know, I started making parallels. And while it's not exactly the same, of course, the parallels between um, Samson's hubris and then Macbeth's hubris and then being persuaded by uh, a very cold-hearted woman, you know. And, and then uh, Dr. Maslin was mentioning how she sees a parallel between the, uh, the story of Macbeth and um, King Saul, once again, being persuaded by the women in his life. So, or Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, then we go back to Adam and Eve. So there we go. It, well, it, uh, yes, but the temptation is not an, an erotic one, right? It's, um, right. it's, it's the manliness of the, uh, of the, the witches aren't manly. They're somehow... Uh, they're they're both. They they can't decide whether they're are you human, are you real, and then you you look like women, but you have beards like men. So they, kind of hybrid of some strange sort. But they're certainly not. Um, uh, it's certainly not their uh, their erotic. Uh, they're being erotic and that attracting the the attention of the of men that is the problem here. So um, with with Delilah with with Eve. I mean, it, it does seem, like, uh, let's say with David and um, Bathsheba, it, it, that's an important element. And it's not the attractiveness of the witches or the attractiveness of Lady <laughs> Mary. You know, I'm sorry, it, it, it cut out. No, thank you. Thank you. That, well, if uh, I don't think we should uh, take advantage too much of that. We're almost going a uh, full hour. Of course, we don't want to do quite that. Um, uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, this concludes our, uh, our it's a fourth annual Women's School Academic Lecture. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, there's some cookies and uh, water here if you want to hang out. Uh, sorry, uh, Director. <laughs> they haven't invented that yet. <laughs> but we do want to thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, we can come have you come down for uh, for another for, for a festival one year. Uh, but uh, until then, thank you so much. Uh, you guys are doing great work. Uh, to, to be able to bring these different aspects together, not just a kind of interdisciplinary approach to Shakespeare, but uh, being able to work with the library, work with uh, artworks. I mean, uh, that that combination is is fantastic. So, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a great community yeah. festival. It really is. There's uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, way of bringing everyone together. Everyone at the college, everyone in the in the, uh, the city, uh, artists, academics, uh, business. 
Uh, I, I will say one thing, uh, the festival ends, I didn't mention it, but Shakespeare. Yeah, that's right. It ends with a Shakespeare festival. So uh, last night on the 29th. So if you haven't already got your tickets, uh, please do. Valley Brewers. That's right. So, uh, well, thank you. And um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Gish. I really appreciate the talk. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, there's cookies, there's water, there's